Hi, everyone. Welcome to our podcast. Uh, I'm Chris Chappell. I'm Shelley Zhang. And I'm Matt Ganesda. Tonight, we're three. So, here's a little bit of trivia. The Korean War, which was fought from 1950 to 1953, never technically ended. There was just a ceasefire, and North and South Korea remained at war. Except the big news is that after almost 70 years, the Korean War may finally be coming to an end. Yay! Maybe. Maybe. Negative Nancy here is always like, eh, well, we still might have a war. Why do I you just, love war so much, Shelley? I'm just saying, they just said they were going to talk about ending it this year. Well, today, South Korean President Moon Jae-in and Kim Jong-un have vowed to end the war by the end of the year and work toward a complete denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula. Kind of surprising since a year ago, it seemed like all anyone was talking about was how President Trump would get into a nuclear war with North Korea. No, no, no. That was like 14 months ago. Thank you for fact checking. And I remember two years ago, Chris, you and I were actually uh, at the DMZ where we set foot in North Korea. Are you saying and they, we're the reason for the peace on the Korean Peninsula? Uh, yes, we are. But also, I was going to say that, remember, uh, to get into the DMZ, we had to sign a form acknowledging that if we did so, we could die. Yeah, that's not something most tourist attractions make you do. Have you not been to Disney World lately? I've never been to Disney World. What? Do they make you sign a death warrant? Oh my God. The death waiver, but... Death waiver. <laughs> Wait, wait, how can you have never... I think we need to make that a special episode of America Uncovered. Chris goes to Disney World. <laughs> hey, I'm from Los Angeles. I went to Disneyland. That was my backyard. Before tickets became like $100 plus. dollars. So getting back to the real Magic Kingdom, oh, happiest, North Korea. Yes, the happiest place on Earth. The happiest place on Earth, according to Korean state-run media. North Korean state-run media. True Korean state-run media. Yeah, so what do you guys think of the... Stunning news that happened over the past couple of weeks. It just goes to show how badly everyone is at predicting the outcome of geopolitical events. No, I knew exactly this was going to happen. I just didn't feel like saying anything. Oh, you just, yeah. You, see, in your heart, you knew that this was going to happen. Yes. I always believed in peace, unlike you, Shelley. Uh-huh. I am the warmonger here. Clearly. Clearly. I'm just trying not to say like at all. Like war? You like war? No. I can splice that up to make you sound like you like like war. Do you like war or do you like like war? And you're off the podcast. <laughs> no. <clears throat> in the midst of all this, we've seen a pretty big change in the relationship between China and North Korea. Tell us a bit about that, Shelley. You mean when Xi Jinping met with Kim Jong-un? Or just... Is there some other Chinese leader Kim Jong-un could meet with? Yes, Tsai Ing-wen, but we're not going there yeah, on this okay. episode. Uh, that would be a real curveball. <laughs> Kim Jong-un <laughs> meets Chinese leader Tsai Ing-wen. Oh my god, could you imagine? Anyway, so I think it's pretty interesting and, like, honestly, I wasn't really able to pay a lot of attention to the Xi Jinping meeting Kim Jong-un because, I think as you mentioned on the last podcast, they did it while we were in New Zealand without any regard to our schedule. It was so selfish. Mm -hmm. of Xi Jinping and Kim Jong-un. But I think, uh, well, like you mentioned in a recent episode of America Uncovered, Xi Jinping looked nice and slim next to Kim Jong-un, so he definitely looked like the better, uh, more attractive dictator. Should we create a calendar of sexiest dictators? Well, we know that Kim Jong-un was voted sexiest man alive by The Onion, which oh. was then picked up by Chinese state media. Yeah, that's oh, a story yeah. people might not remember. It was about five or six years ago, but it was uh, big news. It's an oldie but a goodie. Mm -hmm. uh, Truer now than it was then. Okay, if we had a calendar of the best looking dictators. Young Stalin. Okay, maybe Ooh. when they were young, like young most. Young Stalin it, was a fox. Oh, speak. Che Guevara, technically not ever really a dictator, but a, a mass murderer. Uh, mm -hmm. He was very handsome. And Fidel Castro was like, okay-ish. Hmm. Okay, well, yeah. we'll have to see what the audience reaction is. If they, if they want this, we can make it. <laughs> we could, we we, could we sell need... that as merch. Is that what you're saying? 12 different dictators. 
uh, as handsome as possible. You know, there's not going to be any uh, female dictators, though. There haven't really been mass murdering female dictators, have there? No, like, not since, like, that woman who, like, bathed in her female servant's blood or whatever, like. What are you talking about? Bathory? Like, don't you know? This was, like, way in y y Europe. Shelly, I'm past. really sick of your pro war, anti women sentiment. Oh, my God, I can't. Okay. Speaking of it, formerly attractive world leaders, people posted on Reddit a photo of the South Korean president, Moon Jae-in, mm -hmm. when he was young in the 70s, and he was pretty good looking. Very strong jawline. Like, really? Handsome guy. And then people started calling him Moon bae in on, you know, Reddit because that's what the internet is for. Wait, what does that mean? You don't know what bay means? Bay, no. Bay, like babe. It well, it means yeah, attractive person. Or I mean, I have respect or, for women, so I don't use these kind of terms to describe them. No, they use it to guys. describe dudes. Oh. Or it could be girls, maybe. Ugh, I'm now. I feel old. Let's cut this part out. No, it's staying in there. <laughs> but so obviously, this was a huge change in relations for. China and North Korea because the Kim family had been aligned with the political opponents of Xi Jinping. In fact, Kim Jong-un and Xi Jinping had never met in person until this all went down. Yes, although I don't know that we can say that like Kim and Xi are now best buddies or anything. I just think it now has become like a perfect storm of like different things going on in these countries like domestically and in the relationship between them that made this the whole thing possible like between the North Korean like nukes and like m missile testing South Korea getting a new leader who had after the scandal from the previous leader who like now Moon kind of wants to like forge his like a legacy of, and if they can do this peace thing between North Korea and South Korea that would be historic Kim wants to I think Kim Jong-un was loving what was happening today. Oh yeah, if you he, saw the video, he seemed like a happy camper. Like the attention, the like basking on the stage as an important world leader making mm -hmm. a historic. And know, holding Moon Jae-in's hand. I mean, yes. he was a hottie in the 70s. Yeah, that's true. So it was actually pretty funny like watching them like hold hands and walk over the the curb that symbolized the barrier bear. between north yes. and south Korea. and they were holding hands well like i think because like moon if you saw the footage previous like moon had to invite kim to like step over to the south korean side and that's where they shook hands and whatever mm -hmm. and then like kim was like do you want to come over to the north korean side here i'll take you over yeah i was half expecting like for a bunch of guards to come out of the bushes and be like, <laughs> I was like, it's a trap <laughs> i was gonna say you know it would be hilarious <laughs> like they invite him over and then they they just arrest him and, and then, then that would be the start of an actual war wait who arrests who? South Korea no, arrests No, South North Korea, Korea arrests Kim Jong-un, and then that would they basically be... cause the collapse of North Korea. That's not what would happen. That's Quite no. possibly not. Some other general would start a war, and then there'd be chaos. This is why you are not a public relations expert, Matt. I think uh, <laughs> what is interesting, though, when you said it, it, like, if they would like grab him and it would be a trap, there was another part of the footage I saw where like Kim Jong Un, who I've never heard speak before, was talking about like how he brought some like special Pyongyang noodles with him. The cold for, noodles. Yeah, like the special noodles for President Moon and how he hoped President Moon would enjoy them and I was thinking, Don't eat them. Don't eat the noodles. <laughs> but it's kind of well, it plays into certain stereotypes about North Korea that like you see these the North Korean delicacy is like the small amount of cold noodles. Mm -hmm. That's their that's their feast. Well, it's not as bad as it was in the '90s, but yeah, it's not exactly a land of plenty. And that was another interesting thing that like Kim actually admitted some things. Like uh, he was saying that like because Moon talked about maybe coming to North Korea, mm -hmm. right? And then Kim said like, oh, like. We, we apologize in advance for the state of the roads or something like that. 
and like wow. you know for him to like say that is not to admit that the roads are not paved in gold right it's like not in line with north korea propaganda yeah wow so many changes i have they announced where the meeting with president trump and kim jong un will happen there hasn't been an announcement although i don't think so my prediction is it's going to be in china that seems really? likely maybe although the south and north korea thing seems to be happening without really a lot of like intervention or influence from China, although Chinese state-run media was broadcasting this like mm. as a very historic, big moment. Well, it was. I mean, it's a 70-year war ending, or perhaps ending by the end of this year. Yeah, it doesn't sound as fun when you put the caveat. Yeah. Out. Like, I don't know why it takes so long to end a war that's not active. Well, I think because they've tried several times before, but they couldn't agree on things like denuclearization or like ending sanctions like but you don't have to agree on those things to end a war but it's such a big symbolic step that like i think that's one of those things that like if they couldn't come to grips on these like practical things then like they couldn't like make the symbolic gesture do you know what i mean right which is what's very different about this time is that uh, kim has been willing to make these concessions he said that uh uh, withdrawing U.S. troops from the peninsula is no longer a precondition for denuclearization, which is a pretty huge change. Yeah, I haven't had a good chance to read what they said about the denuclearization ex uh, today, but, oh, we're recording this on Friday, so it happened today. But uh, I think this is the first time Kim Jong-un has been in this position. His father, Kim Jong-il, there had been several times where it looked like North and South Korea were going to thaw. I don't know if you remember, maybe like 10 years ago-ish, like they they had like, you know, were flying like relatives who had been separated from the war and like mm. having reunions. So like there was definitely war ebbs and flows, but a lot of times it would be like North Korea making some promises getting like food aid or something in exchange and, and then, then like, once you got the picnic basket you mm -hmm. run away but uh, yeah well they'd set up the Kaesong industrial center for so south korean companies could have manufacturing in north korea and that maybe was you should explain step. what that is because that's a very interesting thing didn't they shut that down well they did shut it down so they opened it up and that was a sign of warming relations and that was like a, a decade plus ago and then a few years ago things got bad and they shut it down. Well, tell us what it is, because that's that's very cool piece of information. Just edit out the part where I quickly look it up on my phone. Man, we, we, we're, we're, we're flowing. How many times have I said like? I don't know. I don't know. I'm not actually listening to what other people are saying. <laughs> <laughs> well, so the Kaesong Industrial Complex was launched in 2004, and it's in North Korea, but sort of just across the border. And it had like 50,000 North Korean workers and a few hundred South Korean workers and managers like overseeing it. And uh, the idea was that for South Korean companies, uh, it's lower cost labor. And for North Korea, it's a source of significant income. Uh, of course, we know now that the North Korean regime essentially steals all the workers' money. They voluntarily give it to their beloved leader. Right, but essentially, you know, South Korean companies were paying like $100 million in wages uh, which, again, the North Korean workers, as you mentioned, voluntarily gave it to their, their beloved leaders. Might not uh, be completely untrue. Yeah, and they, they may have gotten, I don't know how much of it they got to keep, if any of it, but generally speaking, when North Koreans work overseas, uh, whether it's uh, like in China or whatever, they end up, basically, they have to send their wages back. So it's a, it's a pretty raw deal for them. But, of course, it's a raw deal working in North Korea, as it is. Yeah. So, but what happened is, uh, in uh, 2013, there was more tensions, and basically North Korea was like, we're shutting this down. Uh, it's really interesting the different ways North Korea has managed to fund its regime in the face of all the sanctions over the years. Well, well you know uh, the... Drug dealing out of uh, North Korean embassies. Yeah, I mean, that's actually a big, a big deal, because what happens is that, so uh, Kim Jong-un and his father and grandfather, they needed 
foreign currency to be able to buy things like televisions and booze and all these things. That they, so they needed foreign currency. And Swiss private schools. And Swiss yeah. private schools, right, where, where Kim Jong-un went. So to get that, one of the ways is they basically were telling their uh, ambassadors and embassy staff to sell drugs, which is crazy. And they were making millions and millions of dollars from doing this. And but wait, like which drugs? Where were they getting the drugs? Weren't they? We'd have to check that. I think it was like meth. Or, was well, those? meth you could just make. Exactly. In your bathtub, or actually meth. Actually, is... I hear in North Korea, uh, like pot smoking is pretty predominant. Meth now too. Actually, yeah. there was a. Real... Well, marijuana is not illegal in North Korea. And uh, it was yeah. never illegal. Well, I mean, and... marijuana is less concerning to me than the meth part of it. There was a Washington Post article earlier this year or maybe last year that I found really fascinating because it was interviews with recent North Korean defectors, people who've defected within the last five years. And one of the people they talked to was a meth dealer who talked about how that's how he made money was like just, and you know, like people would buy it to like smoke at parties or like socially. And then he got the police off his back by just giving them free meth. So the police would come. Don't try to his, that at home, kids. <laughs> the police would come to his house to smoke meth, you know. So yeah, interesting. Wow. It was just like fascinating article because you so rarely get insight into what people's lives are like. There. Yeah, that's like super interesting. Very funny. Well, but meth is a good drug to sell through your embassies because you know you can you can sort of sneak there's it through no good drug to sell through your embassies, Matt. So that they can manufacture it at a low cost. Because in the 90s, they were starting to make meth in North Korea, and uh, like people were using it as medicine. I, I mean, they don't have a great health care system. I'm not saying meth is a what? good medicine. No, I'm, I'm not making this up. And, uh, but yeah, so you can put it in like a diplomatic pouch or diplomatic labeled cargo, right? And so it's much easier for diplomats to be able to do that. But at any That's rate... bonkers. It, at any rate, you know, North Korea selling meth overseas is not the worst thing the regime has done. Uh, you know, if you commit a crime in North Korea, you know, not only do you get punished, but like up to two generations in your family on either side can get punished. Sent to the uh, labor, camps. labor camps. So like, <laughs> anyway, I mean, more relativism here, right? But at any rate, not a, not a great situation. But what's interesting is now, so to go back to the, the warming relations, just because Kim Jong-un is now meeting with Xi Jinping and Moon Jae-in and very likely Donald Trump, it doesn't mean that he's now a good guy. That's true. It's interesting. There was a, uh, Ian Bremmer, who's like a political analyst or journalist, he uh, wrote on Twitter that he thinks that if this happens, like if the North Korean peninsula really denuclearizes if they end the Korean War, then he thinks that, you know, Trump, Xi, Kim, and Moon should get the Nobel Peace Prize. Dang. And people, he then he was tweeting about how people were really upset at him for saying that because of Trump, and he's like, what about the dictator who, <laughs> who I also suggested? But I think what is interesting is, at first, I really didn't know if Trump was strategically mouthing off or just getting angry and doing it. But I read something today about, and I hadn't really thought about this, about how one of the first meetings he had with Obama when he was president-elect mm -hmm. still was Obama warned him about the North Korea missile situation, like the ballistic missiles, uh, and how that could be one of the biggest threats he Trump would have to deal with in his presidency. So it's quite possible that this was actually something that the administration was aware of and working on early on. We just couldn't see it. That's true. And also, you know, the media focuses a lot on the president, but there's a continuity of government agencies over the course of many presidents. So even though the president is going to hire and fire the leaders of agencies, you've got a lot of staff and you've got a lot of policy papers and policy ideas that are going to be fairly consistent over the course of many decades. And so uh, the ways in which the U.S. government has 
thought about these issues and strategized. Like Trump had access to all of that from previous administrations. Oh, yeah, he probably, well, it's clear what was not working. I mean, since Kim Jong-un came to power, there were like 86 missile tests. So he was definitely very aggressively pushing that forward. And, you know, it's, it's interesting that South Korean President Moon Jae-in and the South Korean foreign minister, they both came out and said, well, you know, Trump deserves a lot of credit for this situation. I think Trump and Kim are both pretty happy today. Oh, I imagine so. Yeah. I mean, Kim gets to avoid being destroyed. Well, I don't think he thought it was going to come to that. I think what he's, ha what he's happy about is more the recognition, like... Well, yeah, I mean, isn't that how it, how it works? It's like you, like, so your choices as Kim Jong-un, total annihilation, or you can have this nice route where you get normalized relationships and you get to be on TV and everyone's like, oh, Kim Jong-un, he's an honorable guy. That's what... Uh, I want to cut my hair like Kim Jong-un. <laughs> oh, that's going to be the latest craze. I mean, and, that's why he's going into our calendar. And as long as you, you like, do all of this stuff, we're just going to ignore the human rights problems that are happening under your... Dictators. Right. Well, I mean, that's what worked for China. I mean, when relations were normalized thanks to Nixon, all of the human rights problems in China disappeared. I mean, I think that's actually is the blueprint that Kim wants to follow, is becoming a normalized country the way that the, the, the PRC, People's Republic yeah. of China. So did normalizing relations between the U.S. and the People's Republic of China, did that improve China's human rights. Well, I think there are some important differences between the two countries that you'd have to take into consideration. Like the Communist Party after Mao was never, and then may maybe until today, was never like a single dictator in charge of everything. In Kim Jong-un, you have a, a, like the F Kim family is deified. They are the gods of North Korea. So it's a different situation where you have that kind of leadership of a country. That's true. I mean, I think because after Mao died, there was a lot of power struggles and a lot of different ideas on how to yeah. transition China. I mean, Ch right? China in the 80s was very different than at any other point in modern history. Yeah, there were more, uh, it was a more open society in the late 80s in China than at any other point since the Communist Party took over in 49. Yeah, and that was largely thanks to Deng Xiaoping's left and right hands, uh, Hu Yaobang and Zhao Ziyang, who, well, they were interesting because they wanted not just economic reforms, that was kind of Deng Xiaoping's thing, but they wanted political reform as well. And they and we all of, know how that turned well, out. Well, they yeah. all ended up purged. So. So, but you know, I think the first priority for, for Trump and for Moon and Xi when it comes to dealing with Kim Jong-un is first, avoid nuclear war and that is ranks so much higher than solving North Korea's human rights abuses that it makes sense from a political standpoint to just be like all right we're not going to talk about the human rights right now we're just going to make sure we don't all get nuked but it also doesn't solve the human rights problem and and to the extent that a lot of people in the world think that it's not good if any country you know kills its own people and throws them in labor camps then at some point this conversation needs to be had, but maybe this isn't the time. I don't know. It when will it be is. easier to have that conversation when they don't, when they're not pursuing nuclear armaments. Yeah, although I think there is some legitimacy to the, what that one South Korean person was saying that you quoted in the American Uncovered oh, episode. Oh, the young student. Yeah, about how like fundamentally, it's still the same regime that you're dealing with. So. Can you take what they're saying in good faith? Maybe, maybe not. That's the same thing with uh, Iran. You know, they said they would agree to this uh, nucle nuclear, um, the nuclear deal, and they would get rid of their nukes. And you know, there's a lot of questions about how much they've actually adhered to any of their promises. So that's something that, if all of this goes as it seems to be going now, maybe uh, you know th we have to see if North Korea actually uh, follows through with any of its promises. But if the U.S. pulls out of the Iran deal, that could give cover to North Korea to like... Actually, the, it's, it's really fascinating the way Iran and North Korea, their nuclear programs, have worked so closely with each other. Mm -hmm. There's actually stories about uh, of like a, a facility in Iran of North Korean nuclear scientists. Uh, and apparently it's like a lovely place by the water and you know that's got to be the best 
job any North Korean has anywhere in the world. Luxuriating in this Iranian. I don't know. Have you seen the, the girls that have to, or were part of the North Korean cheer squad that they sent out? To that the... one brief moment seemed like it was pretty nice, but I imagine the training was probably a nightmare. They've trained since age four to cheer for the Olympic team. Uh, I mean, there were some stories, I don't know, about like how they are forced to act as more or less prostitutes for high-level North Korean officials and things like that. So mm. maybe not as cheerful as they look. On, well. But like they do get to live a comparatively privileged life. Like anybody who lives in Pyongyang in North Korea is like somebody who has like a more privileged life. There actually was a really interesting book I read, one of the best books, nonfiction books I read last year called Nothing to Envy by Barbara Demick. And it was interviews. Uh, and like she interviewed a bunch of North Korean defectors who had defected in the 90s during the famine. Mm. And it was a really interesting look at, and they were mostly from like a small mining town that was further north, who like the further away from Pyongyang you get in North Korea, the less politically favored you are. Mm. So the harsher your life is. So like for these like mining towns on the border, like the people who were sent there were all people who had political problems and then generations of their families now suffer. But it was interesting to see how people had to live their lives and kind of survive and still had families and still fell in love, but like were trying to kind of survive not only the North Korean regime, but also the famine that happened there in the 90s. So it was fascinating, highly recommend like book to get an idea of what it was like to live under something like that. Yeah, I'm always amazed at like the things human beings go through. Like, you know, like any one of us will be like, oh yeah, we've had a real lousy day. <laughs> but that was kind like, of a crummy hotel we stayed in in New Zealand. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, hopefully no one from there is listening. Um, but yeah, just, just the things that happened. And I, I think that's an interesting thing you just mentioned about how, and this happened, this happened in every communist society where if you're not politically favored, things get very, very bad for you. I think that's something, you know, we in free democratic societies need to be vigilant against the idea that, like, uh, you know, people with different political views are the enemy and need to be purged. I think especially in the United States at this time, you know, to grossly simplify things, there's these two sides and they each hate each other and there can be no recognition thankfully, of the common humanity. Well, thankfully... It's not a system where one side has all the power and therefore can purge people. That's like, true. You know who we really owe a thanks to for solving the North Korea problem? Dennis He's Rodman. Rodman. Yes. yes. How could we forget? He is the one who showed us the way. He showed us that love is the answer. And also whatever, like, cryptocurrency he advertises on his T-shirt every time <laughs> does, he goes. Does he? Yeah. Yeah, it was, it was some cryptocurrency that's somehow tied with marijuana. I forget what it is, but it's like they basically sponsor him. So every time he goes to North Korea and has a press release about going to North Korea, like, has a press conference, he like, wear their merch. And, yeah. Guys, I have a great idea <laughs> for how we can fund the show. Yeah. <laughs> uh, invent our own cryptocurrency or just get backed by one? Get backed by one on our trips to North Korea. Though I guess it might not be such a thing to go to North Korea pretty soon. We need to find a new oppressive regime that's a new hermit kingdom that we can be the Dennis Rodman equivalent of. Dennis Rodman's sponsor is called Potcoin. Potcoin. Oh my wow. god. Okay. Well, so, so this is the guy who's going to solve the North Korean crisis. Solved it. But this is the crazy mixed up world in which we live in. When did we get into the craziest timeline? This is the craziest timeline? Or the funniest timeline? I don't know. It's all probably has something to do with I would with say CERN. maybe 2012. Maybe the world ended. Oh my gosh. After it sounds the like Mayan a Philip calendar. K. Dick. And Novel. now we're just, like, living in some weird, like... Purgatory as we all descend towards hell. Yeah, well, wait. That's lost, right? 
Oh man, are we going to talk about Lost? Because I can talk. No, we're Never. not going to talk Lost, about Lost. Lost, the island was not purgatory. It was real. I haven't watched the show. I this haven't is watched just it what either. I've absorbed through right. cultural well, osmosis. We're going to spend 120 hours this weekend watching all of Lost. <laughs> we can maybe it, skip around the third season when there was the writer's strike and it, 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 it kind of showed. If you can find... 120 hours this weekend, then I will watch Lost with you. Guys, what I'm gonna watch this weekend is Infinity War. Oh, man. oh yeah. I have got I've got to catch up on a lot of the other movies I've missed. I haven't seen Spider Man. I haven't seen Black Panther. I think you probably will want to see them before watching. Or yeah, like actually, some I think Vulture like published a list of like the Marvel movies you definitely have to have seen mm. before watching. Infinity War to understand who the characters are. Well, you don't have to watch Spider-Man, right? Because you get who Spider, like you, you know who Spider-Man is. Some kind of man spider, right? Exactly. But like you, you get what the characters, but I think that people aren't super familiar with Black Panther. I don't know, yeah. I wasn't until I watched the movie. But I think Black Panther is not that, they think it's like they suggested Doctor Strange because really? he apparently has a lot of screen time. Huh. In this, well, because in... he's going to be part of the next generation, right? But also, I think because he has one of the stones, I think like part of their mm. their recommendation was also based around like un if you want to understand the, the powers meta. of the different Infinity Stones, uh. you have to have seen the ones in which the Infinity Stones, like ma like Guardians of the Galaxy one or mm -hmm. the second Thor, which I did not, I have not seen any of the oh, Thors. I couldn't make it through the second I've Thor. I've only seen Ragnarok. I had not seen anything before that. You know what would be funny? To, to have a movie where all the characters from Infinity Wars are actually the characters uh, that those actors played in previous shows or movies. So like Chris Pratt is like the Chris Pratt from Parks and Rec and Benedict Cumberbatch is like Sherlock. Sherlock. I'm, are you advocating a movie that This sounds more this? like fanfic, Matt. Uh, I mean, wow, the intellectual property rights headache that that would be is pretty incredible. Everything's legal on the internet. Well, I guess if you did it as a parody, it would be fine, but also pretty darn confusing. I mean, I think Infinity Wars is already going to be kind of confusing. I mean, you've got so many characters. I guess if you're not intimately familiar with it. Hey, speaking of outer spacey kind of stuff, because I think that's something that happens in the Avengers... Uh, we're China's going, going to the moon. moon. Oh, we're, we're also going to the moon. Uh, oh yeah, that's China true. and the U.S. are going to the moon. I I'm more excited about but, the U.S. going to the moon, but than not the moon. at the same time. Look, the point is, this is a great opportunity for us to make Sailor Moon references. Yes, let's talk about Sailor Moon. I mean, there's a President Moon. Oh, there we go. It all it all ties in together. It all ties in together. Well, so the episode on China Uncensored that's coming out Monday is about basically the Chinese military, which is run by the Communist Party, having these ambitious plans for Space building- Space warfare, moon bases, yeah. building moon, a moon palaces. Base. Yeah. I, yeah, when I saw the photos, I'm like, palace seems a little is strong. A stretch. Especially when you find out, so they've released this, uh, April 24th was the third uh, space day which is a thing in China. And so the, Nas the China National Space Administration released this video where they're showing the history of China's space program and also the lunar palace that they're going to build on the moon. And they call it a palace because it relates to this ancient Chinese story about a moon princess, a Chinese princess who lived on the moon, really. Yeah, well, a sailor moon, lived obviously. on the moon, was semi-banished to the moon, you know. You say potato, I say potato. Um, but yeah, so it's definitely, the video does not make it seem like it's a palace. And then when you find out that they've been uh, testing, doing human experiments essentially on what it would be like to live in one of these capsules, they've had university students uh, living in a replica on Earth uh, over the past six months where they've had to, uh, you know, live off of food that was... Well, fertilized with their own poop. That's not a palace. No Chinese so. emperor ever had to do that. I gotta say, that's not something that's unheard of in the Chinese countryside. Probably not anymore, but... But in space? 
well, in space, like, I guess, what are you going to do, bring cows with you? Oh, That's funny story. Idea. The first, so this is all going to lead into space warfare. Apparently, the first weapon ever in space was this special uh, Soviet gun used for shooting Siberian bears. Because when they put the, the first cr uh, cosmonaut crew, uh, they were afraid that they were going to end up crashing in the Siberian force, so they gave them this bear shooting gun. Oh, but they made it into space, so... It was the first weapon in space. Well, that's... Something designed to kill terrestrial bears. That is heartwarming. Well, space wars, I feel like if, if technology and geopolitics continue at the current trajectories, mm -hmm. like, we will see a very much a space war type environment in 100 years. Well, technically, we're already having space wars. Uh, but it's very primitive. Like if you look, and this is, uh, there was a report uh, submitted to the U.S. government. Well, wait, about hold this. on. I have to explain what I meant by that. Otherwise, it sounds like I'm crazy. Uh, oh, Chris. What? <laughs> Nothing. There, there's already space wars going on. <laughs> Don't you know about the Draco uh, aliens and the Greys and the tall Nordic ones? Oh, no. What? I don't. Yeah. <laughs> Shelly, spend more time on the Internet. Um, what well, I think you and I are going to very different parts of the internet. <laughs> it's all it all runs together. What I was s really saying is that uh, satellites in space already play a huge role in modern warfare, from GPS for soldiers and for missiles, communications, spy satellites. So space has already become a part of modern warfare, and because of that, uh, enemy combatants knows that to cripple your opponent, you need to target those satellites. So what I'm hearing is that if we have a space war, the internet is the first thing that will go. No! Yes, actually that is that is a huge thing. The, the internet will go down, um, which would create mass confusion. And where would we see our cats? I don't know how I would know anything anymore without Wikipedia. Like, would I have to chaos. go look it up in a book in a library somewhere? But if you, if you look at the current uh, use of space for, for wars, it's kind of like 100 years ago, we were using, uh, in World War I, we were using biplanes. And these, like, very primitive airplanes, which had only been really invented a decade earlier, were flying in the war. Uh, they were used basically just for reconnaissance. And then later they mounted some very simple guns on them and they were fighting each other, right? But, you know, look what happened just, you know, a few decades later, World War II, and planes had become far more sophisticated by the late 30s. They were able to fly long distances, drop bombs, uh, really cause major terror. And it wasn't that long of a period between those two things. And now you look at where we are now 100 years later in terms of airplane technology. We've got planes that can fly around the world. You've got uh, very sophisticated drones. You've got uh, helicopters. You've got supersonic uh, jets. So all so the, the way the technology has uh, increased on Earth, if you, if you imagine that mapped to the next 100 years in space, you would have just an incredibly frightening and sophisticated... Shell, you're making I'm, all kinds of faces. I'm not sure you can do a one-to-one -one mapping like that, though. Like, you, like, how far has, like, space technology, rocket technology come since the 60s? Well, not very far, because the, the, the aliens reason... on the moon have told us to stop developing it. Wait, I thought it was because the aliens had sent the Sophons or whatever... To... No, that's a work of science fiction, the three bodies problem. I'm talking about real science fiction. Aliens on the moon, Shelley. I thought you, it was mean the, you mean the Decepticons on the, on the dark side yeah. of the moon? No, that's also science fiction. That was a movie. Okay. Yeah. So this is the real issue with space warfare. It's going to be lame. There's not going to be cool sounds like in the movies. Matt, this is something that always gets on your nerves. Yeah, there is you... no sound in space because there's nothing to carry well, the sound. Well, specifically, lasers, you can't see lasers, apparently. No, you can't. It's just invisible beams. You can see it if, it's, uh, if you're at the end of it, but if it's traveling through space, there's nothing to refract it. And so if you're on invisible. the end of that laser, do you really have time to see it? 
Not really. Yeah. I really feel like they should develop lasers that somehow are colorful and also make a sound that's like pew, 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 pew. Yeah. I mean, Star Wars really set us up for disappointment. Like, that's not the reality of space. But I think, you know, if the real reason, in my view, that space hasn't been developed in terms of, you know, moon colonies and stuff over the, since the 60s is that it just wasn't a national priority for the United States. And so... Was it it, though? Because there was that declassified document about how they needed to build a moon base on the moon before the Soviet Union. Oh, that's right. When was yeah, it? Yeah, yeah. It was 1959 that they wrote that paper. So you see, that's still like the space race was the 60s, and then once that was done... It's like we, we won space against the Soviets, essentially. America. Uh, and so it's like America won, and then the Hi. U.S. government's like, well, we really maybe need to cut the funding to NASA because it was such a huge portion of our GDP. America won so much as then the Soviet Union collapsed. Shelley, I'm not going to let you argue that America did not win the space race. That's, that's not allowed. But at any rate, for the last several decades, so just NASA hasn't had a lot of money. The priorities have been kind of switched back and forth depending on the presidents. Some presidents want the moon, some presidents want Mars, and NASA's like, okay, well, what do you want? Like, we, they go back and repurpose, like, decade-old projects. And there's all kinds of challenges. I mean, Mars ain't no place to raise your kids. In fact, it's cold as hell. Is that from something? Oh, I'm disappointed. I, what is that from? You, you can read the comments from the listeners. Um, no, you need to tell me. Elton John. Oh, well, I feel Rocket like that Man. was like the inferior. Hey, and speaking of song. Rocket Man, we go back to what Trump said about Kim Jong Un. The David Bowie one, Space was, Oddity. Space Oddity was a better lonely space guy. Song. The the one that you refer to as the one David Bowie did. I don't think these are your opinions. I think you're just spouting off something. Well, since I actually remember the David Bowie song and apparently forgot about Rocket Man, I think I can still have this opinion, even if no. I didn't remember that it was called Space Oddity. But anyway, the, the moon is much more realistic to build a base. Like, we can travel to the moon in less than a week. It's like half a week away at, at current technology. And well, what you were saying about different presidents have put different priorities, uh, Trump has clearly made it a priority. Um, I He's think the first I'm going to say it's because of Newt Gingrich. Secret moon base? Yes. Yeah, Newt Gingrich. So we have Dennis Rodman to thank for North Korea and Newt Gingrich for future moon plans. Well, he, I mean, that was one thing that he actually said when he was running for president, That's too. That's right. Yeah, well, so the moon is valuable not just for uh, the space wars, but also you mm -hmm. can... The cheese. The cheese. It's all about the cheese. Well, yeah, so in the new, uh, yeah, it's not just China trying to build a base on the moon. Uh, in the latest presidential directive for NASA, uh, Trump wants the U.S. to lead humanity as being the first one to establish a moon base. He's also the first president to talk about actually sending troops into space. It's more like he's suggested establishing a space force. Like, you know, you've got the Army, Navy, Air Force, Space Force. But I, I guess, prefer to think like, of it as Space Marines. I mean, if you're going to have a Space Force, they're going to go into space, right? I just hope we can finally do something about all these illegal aliens. Which ones? The, the greys, greys, the short greys, the Nordic-looking ones, the reptilian transdimensional ones. I'm getting a ones. little worried now. How much you know <laughs> about this? I, I don't, like, go to these websites. Just it somehow filters in. Uh huh. It's the the internet magically shows you. Well, the way I use the internet is I just kind of put my face up to the screen and cre and it creates sort of this osmosis connection between me and the matrix. Uh huh. <laughs> <laughs> As you were saying, Matt, uh, the moon isn't just about space war. There's also helium three on the moon, and I know about helium three from that wonderful movie Moon, starring. David Bowie's son. It all comes full circle. So the he helium-3 can be used for nuclear fusion, which if we can get it to work... I was be... like, what nuclear fusion? Well, I mean, obviously, the, the challenge is, is getting nuclear fusion to a point where it takes less energy to put in than you get out of it, and we're still not quite there yet. But I have a feeling it, this is about to get very scientific. 
No, yeah. that, that's it. That's it. But so you've got a, a potential source of, of fusion fuel. You've got a low gravity environment where you could do much more efficient construction of large spacecraft. To then go to Mars. And then you also have a rabbit that makes the elixir of life. That's true. Only so according to ancient Chinese stories. Well, so China loves to make, or rather the Chinese Communist Party loves to make claims that uh, territory belongs to them since ancient times. So do you think because uh, the Chinese princess, princess Chang'e lived on the moon, China has a claim? Well, if we're going to go by moon princesses, I think Japan has a serious claim as well. Oh, why? Why do you think that is, Shelley? Well, okay, there's two moon princesses that I know of in Japan. Mm. One that was in the in the Big Bird Goes to Japan video that I watched as a child. Interesting. And the second one, of course, is Princess Serenity herself. Ah, the Silver Millennium. Yes, Sailor Moon. I, too, fight evil by moonlight and find love by daylight. Ah, uh, I think it's winning love by daylight, Chris. Well, I'm talking about what I do, okay. not, not a show. Okay, okay. It's <sighs> apparently the translation, or that song was completely redone in English. Like, it has no relation to I'm the actual I'm glad Japanese there were a lot lyrics. of things in the actual Japanese storyline that was sanitized for the U.S. market. Yeah, I don't think we're talking about, like, the same sex aliens it was the like the same sex alien partners it was the like the japanese song had more to do with like love and like the relationship between tuxedo mask and sailor moon or something matt like that. is asleep he is zoning out i've i've never watched sailor moon you're missing life. out yeah what were you doing as a child at 6 30 in the morning on weekends eventually I, they had pokemon on i did watch time. cartoons but I just Sailor Moon wasn't among those cartoons, but but mostly my parents uh, wanted to have me watch uh, PBS because they didn't want me to see all these advertisements. So it was mostly like Sesame Street and stuff. Uh -huh. Suddenly, so many things are clear. <laughs> well, and then you grew up and watched The Simpsons, so <laughs> yeah. clearly the PBS. Well, no, my, really my worked. the one show when I was like a teenager, my my. Uh, mother forbade me to ever watch Married with Children. Oh, oh. my God. That seems so quaint now. Mine too. I know. Yeah. And actually. it's like, that is so, yeah, it's so tame by current standards. But obviously, because I was banned from watching it, like, what did I watch whenever my parents weren't home? It's clearly not that. Sailor Moon. Not uh, Sailor Moon. I can't believe you didn't know about the Moonlight Night. I did not know about the Moonlight Night. Yeah, there's... Also, I didn't realize that they only translated two seasons of the Japanese anime into English. Oh, yeah, English. it was very, very little. It was very little, because, like, they would just keep replaying them over, and I, because I had to sneak watching this when uh -huh. my parents were asleep, I wouldn't see, like, a whole season, so I mm. just, like, Your see... strict parents were not, uh, you don't think they would have been a fan of you watching um, Japanese anime? Well... Sailor Moon? I mean... I'm going to say no because there was like a boy involved and there was like romance. Tuxedo Mask was a man, Shelley. That's true. Actually, that's creepy. Sailor Moon, she was 14 and Tuxedo Mask was in college. What? what? Whoa. <laughs> yeah. Japan is a strange place. Yeah, no, and you like, criticize me for not watching. I mean, you don't know that as a kid. She could have been any age in high school. So, in consideration of the, our audience that might not be huge Sailor Moon fans, uh, the, going back to the whole territorial claims on the moon, uh, this is the interesting part about why there's suddenly this rush between uh, not just the U.S. and China, but also Russia, uh, India is trying to send uh, probes up to the moon. A lot of countries now are making this big push to get to the moon. I think the reason all these countries are making a big push to go to the moon is because everyone's trying to stake their claim to the moon. Uh, now, according to, the, I think it was the 1967 UN Space Treaty, no one is allowed to own the moon. Uh, that was signed by like 100 countries, including China. Is, is but that international allowed to own treaties, all yeah. of the moon or allowed to own parts of the moon? Uh, I think, I'm not 100% sure, but I think it's it's any both of those. Uh-huh. But so this is why Antarctica is really important, which is why you also see China trying to make claims in Antarctica now, is because Antarctica is going to be a uh, template 
for how the countries of the world handle space. So Antarctica was divided up between the 12 countries that had scientific research uh, stations going on there. And so it's very likely that the moon will be handled in similar ways. The countries that are there doing scientific research will get the research claim to whatever parts of the moon they have. But there's, a, there's another way to look at it, which is that uh, a country's ability to utilize the moon is more a factor of whether they've built stuff and have the ability to operate from there. Because if you look at what the Communist Party has done in the South China Sea, they have taken these shoals, uh, which were in international waters, claimed that they were part of Chinese territory since ancient times, which you could say is debatable. But at any rate, uh, most people in the international community, most countries said, you can't build there, they're not yours, stop. And the Communist Party insisted, they had their military do it anyway. And now they have bases there and they have uh, you know, military facilities on what are those you talking places. About? They're totally civilian islands where people, you know, eat at restaurants and things like that, according it, yeah. to the right. propaganda and so, photos. So what, what really matters with the moon is if, you know, if the Communist Party's military builds bases and, uh, you know, some sort of way to utilize the moon, they have it. And it doesn't matter what international law says because they will treat international law on the moon, the same way they treat it in the South China Sea, and the same way they treat it in general. The Communist Party is not an honest, law-abiding Especially country. because China's space program is run by the military. Right, unlike NASA, which is, is a civilian, is a civilian agency. I mean, it's a government agency, yeah. but it's not military. And top, this is something that the Chinese military leaders have been talking about. Like, they, they feel space warfare is inevitable. And so this is something they're preparing for. So, I mean, it's understandable that, you know, I, I don't think it's necessarily just Trump, but any president who's, who would be currently the president, had Hillary won, had another candidate won, probably that president would still say, oh my gosh, look at what the Communist Party is doing. America has to step up their game for the moon. It sounds far-fetched, but this could be a serious issue in the not-too-distant future. We're talking how many years? Uh, it could I, I be 10 years. I think 20, 30 years. We'll see it, and it, and it won't seem sci-fi at all in, in 20 years. I mean, we're only 12 years away from 2030. That's nuts. I remember as a kid having one of those, like, this will be the future books, like, you know, like illustrated books, and it had all these futuristic space station ideas about how, like, there would be, like, a space station on the moon or there would be some kind of, like, weird tube that would lead from Earth to the moon and then like, you know, Space yeah. But, but you know what's a game changer for moon bases is artificial intelligence because we are quickly developing the technology to be able to send uh, largely autonomous robotics to go to the moon with supplies and build there and set things up and even start uh, doing some, you know, farming and stuff without any human being there. We're, we're not there yet, but we could be there pretty soon. And that Elon will... Musk is already sending cars into space. That's true. Although those are not artificial intelligence cars because Elon Musk would be terrified of those. That's true. Those cars are for humans of the future. Yeah, but it's just, it's just not that hard to build a moon base now as it was you know, 30 years ago when computer technology wasn't there. I feel like the idea of an artificial intelligence designed and built moon base on the dark side of the moon is like the perfect setting for some kind of horror sci-fi. Or some kind of Transformers movie. Uh, uh. Well, I think ultimately the problem with all of this, this, this conversation about moon bases and space forces and space warfare or whatever, uh, is, is that it really kind of reinforces the propaganda that the Earth is a globe. When in fact, <laughs> the Earth I know what's coming. As the elves have known from ancient the times. The Earth is flat, yes. And I that think. Just asked B.O.B. And I think on the flat Earth note, it's time to wrap up our second episode of our podcast. Thanks it's for listening. It's getting a little flat. <laughs> no. Uh... It's well rounded. Thanks for listening, everyone. Uh, once again, I'm Chris Chappell. 
I'm Shelly Jong. And I'm Matt Ganesda. Leave your comments below for what topics you'd like us to cover and if you have any suggestions for us. Yes, and we will be putting this on all of the places where you normally put podcasts, a.k.a. not YouTube. Fighting evil by moonlight Winning Winning love by daylight daylight. Never running from a real fight She's the one named Sailor Moon. You are a fan! (laughs)